When he retired, the ultra-conservative Pope Benedict XVI was expected to disappear from view, clearing the way for his liberal successor, Francis. To clean the house in the notoriously corrupt Vatican. Instead, Benedict stayed, setting the stage for the destabilizing brawl over morality, theology, and the church horrific legacy of sexual abuse. After six years as a pope, the verdict is in. Francis is soft on homosexuals, the lesbians, and the transsexuals and his papacy seems to be unraveling. My name is Brent Winfield, and I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, and this is the Advent message. Today the Catholic Church is divided by a power contest between conservatives and liberals. The two camps are represented by the popes, Benedict and Francis. The question is, who are the so-called good guys and who are the so-called bad guys? Well, answer depends on whose side you take in the onslaught of texts and tweets and blogs, as well as the tr trumpetings of the Catholic media. In the conservative uh, media, National Catholic Register, the prominent Catholic writer Vittoria Missouri had this to say. He accused Francis of creating a church in which everything is unstable and unchangeable. Now what makes this prospect of a division of a church within the church more severe and far riskier than the usual bickering? is a prospect of two popes. Two popes. Both reside in the Vatican, each with his own loyal and vociferous following. The liberals have Francis, but the conservatives have his predecessor, Benedict XVI. If Francis is the living, reigning pope, Benedict is a shadow, the undead pope emeritus. In 2013, Benedict unexpectedly resigned his papacy. He was the first pope to do so in nearly 600 years. Afterwards, he did not, as many expected, depart from an obscure, into an obscure Bavarian monastery. Instead, he stayed put, still accepting little the title of holiness and still wearing the pectoral cross of the Bishop of Rome. He was still publishing, still updating his record, still meeting cardinals, still making statements, still involved. His very existence provides encouragement to conservative critics who want to undermine Francis's reign. Benedict had shrewdly laid the groundwork four months ahead of his resignation. Without signaling the purpose, Benedict ordered a renovation of the convent residence in the Vatican Gardens. He did so in order to create a suitable Vatican retirement home office and chapel with ample space for his living caregiver. People refer to this place as the monastery, but it's more like a palace. At the time of his resignation in 2013, Benedict cited his diminishing strength, but now he shows and continues to show no sign of incapacity. In fact, at 92 years old, he looks very spry. The hostilities reached new heights when Francis was visiting Ireland. Archbishop Carlo Mana Vigno, the formal paper people nuncio to Washington, D.C., and a prominent conservative, issued a letter accusing Francis of turning a blind eye to sexual abuse and calling on him to resign as Pope. Vignano's most serious charge is that 
Francis had reversed sanction and that Benedict had placed in the American Cardinal Theodore McCarrick. Remember him? McCarrick had been accused of sexually abusing adult seminarians as well as an altar boy. Francis was embarrassed when later, after being confronted by a mountain of evidence, hmm, Francis was forced to expel the former cardinal and Archbishop of Washington from the priesthood after he was found guilty of sexual abuse. <clears throat> the move appears to be the first time any cardinal has been defrocked for sexual abuse. And this was marking a critical moment in the Vatican's handling of a scandal that has gripped the church for nearly two decades. An explosive report alleging a cover-up of Catholic priest sex abuses dating back decades. A grand jury in Pennsylvania just issued its report. It found evidence of more than 300 predator priests, all accused of sexually abusing more than 1,000 child victims. And that's just the witnesses who came forward. Friend, in this presentation, I have attempted to show you current events in the papacy that could lead to the roaring of the beast. The purpose of this Advent message is to prepare us all for the days leading up to the coming of our Lord. Brethren, we need to read the signs. The world is seething and roiling in turmoil. For instance, do you know that the Ebola virus is back and killing thousands of people? What about the increase of earthquakes, crime, and rumors of war? Look around you, saint of God. You'll see things coming along at an absurdly rapid pace. And we need to get ready. Get ready. Get ready. Let us pray. Father in heaven, as your return draws closer, we see, O oh Lord, the signs not only in the Vatican but all around us of this age coming to a close. But Lord, we need to be ready for you, not only on a personal level, but ready in spreading the good news of Jesus Christ to others who so desperately need to hear it. Please bless us all, forgive our sins. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, that's all for today, friends. Always remember, God loves you. Yes, he really, really does love you.